Thank you. You can be seated today. Psalm 23, we're going to look at verse 2, but I want us to read verse 1 and 2 to set the platform of what we're doing. If you guys remember last two weeks ago, three weeks ago, whenever the last time I was here, I don't even know what today is other than Sunday, all I know is, is the last time we were together and I was preaching, I did Psalm 23, verse 1. And we talked about who the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. So as David is writing this psalm, I believe as the end of his life, he looks back as a shepherd understanding the intricacies of what needs to take place in the life of a shepherd. This psalm is not about the sheep. This psalm is about the shepherd. This psalm is often read at funerals, and this psalm has more to do with life than it ever did with death. And so with that thought in mind, this trilogy of the Psalm 22, Psalm 23, Psalm 24. For many of you guys, you, if you're not real up to date on Jewish history and why the Jews do what they do, Rosh Hashanah has begun. Yom Kippur was just Saturday, yesterday, and they would be reading in the synagogue yesterday, Psalm 24. And so to the Jew, Psalm 22, 23, and 24 means a whole lot more than it just does to us that we read it in a funeral time. These guys understand that the king of Psalm 24 is coming, the king of glory. And so this beginning of this psalm, verse 1, deals with ownership of the shepherd. In other words, he says, God is my owner. The shepherd, the great shepherd, is my owner. As a sheep, we look to him as the owner of the sheep. Now, how do she, how do shepherds get sheep? Two ways. Number one, he buys them. You've been bought with a price. And number two, he births them. You had to be birthed into the kingdom. Is anybody listening to what I just said? He buys them and he births them. So a shepherd, as David understood the the person of Jesus Christ, he says, "The Lord is my shepherd." Now, verse 1 gives us an understanding of the shepherd's person, but now we come to verse 2 today, and it gives us a glimpse of the shepherd's provision. So last, or two, three weeks ago, we had the shepherd's person. This week, we're looking at the shepherd's provision. Now, I want to say this as a way of introduction. You cannot say the Lord is my shepherd unless the shepherd is your Lord. In other words, it's about lordship. It's not about what we profess, but what is possessed by the Spirit of God on the inside of us. And so with that thought in mind, you can't say the Lord is my shepherd if he's not your Lord. If the shepherd is not your Lord, you can't say the Lord's my shepherd. And so with that thought, let's look at verse 2. Because I shall not want, because of the person of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, in your Bible, which is the word Adonai, also with the conjunction of the word Yahweh, meaning the most holy name that a Hebrew could not speak about God. He said, God of very gods is my shepherd. Then he comes in verse 2 and he says, after I shall not want, or the Lord is my shepherd, what else is there? There's nothing else that could be added to that. If God is my shepherd, what else is there? Verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Let me give you Three important truths about verse 2 today, and I pray that you would allow the Spirit of God to speak to us and in us and through us. First of all, I want us to understand that in verse 2, if the Lord is your shepherd, you ought to be satisfied. See, here's what has happened in American Christianity. We pray a prayer, but then do the best we can. We add Jesus to our religious activity. Let me ask you a question. Why are you trying to find peace and assurance and security in anything and anyone other than Jesus? We try to find it in a, in a bank account, in money, in future planning. Here's what he says. The Lord is my shepherd. Y'all ready? He makes me lie down. You know why he makes you lie down? Because rest for a sheep does not come natural. See, some of us in this room don't fully understand what this says. In other words, the Lord works in our lives and makes us rest. Come unto me, heavy laden, all that's burdened, right? 
I will give you rest. That's salvation. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. Then you will find rest. See, there's rest that's given. There's rest that's found. There's rest that's given in justification. There's rest that's found in sanctification. And so with this satisfying of the shepherd, he makes me lie down. See, a sheep, if you listen away, a sheep will not lie down until they're full. As long as they're hungry, they'll stand. So David says, my shepherd satisfies me to the place that I can lay down. I can rest. So to have rest, there must be peace. You see the tranquility of a green pasture in a meadow. For those of you that's been in Jerusalem or in Israel, there's not many green pastures. In other words, the shepherd has to go to some places and lead us from desert to green pastures. And so the the life of the sheep is totally dependent upon the shepherd. And so David says, the Lord is my shepherd. What else is there? He makes me. He finds green pastures. He keeps me from the garbage and gives me green grass. So let's talk about it. What does this shepherd do? Well, he personifies this peace. It's he that makes me lie down. Why does he personify peace? Well, Ephesians 2, verse 14. Are you okay? Y'all a bunch of kindergartners? That thing flicks twice and y'all go, okay? We got it right here. Ephesians 2, 14 says, He himself is our peace. Listen, you're not going to find peace in something. You find peace in someone. And until you and I get to a place to understand who our shepherd is and the goodness of our shepherd, you're going to constantly wring your hands and be worried with anxiety. And that's the reason Paul says, be anxious for nothing but in all things, in all prayer and supplication, make your request known to who? The Lord Jesus. Why? Because he's the shepherd. He knows what you need. He knows what you need before you ask. And so therefore, when I really quit focusing on who I am and what I need and I start focusing on who he is and I become satisfied in who he is, then I can rest and I can have peace. He himself is our peace. Not only does he personify peace in conversion, he is the one that produces peace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Flip over there because we didn't got... So uh, tune to the screens. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15. Look at what Paul says to the church at Ephesus about Jesus Christ being our peace. Here's what he says. Let me read verse 14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation. Watch this. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man, man from the two, thus making peace. So Jesus not only is the person of peace, he produces peace. How does he produce peace? It's not based upon my work and my religion. It's based upon the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Everything that he's done, everything that he's ever going to have to do has been done. And so I can stand on this platform, I can put my head on a pillow, and I can rest every day of my life knowing that he holds me, I don't hold him. I can't do anything to make him love me more, and I can't make him do anything, I can't do anything to make him love me less. And I praise God that the only person that can do that is a holy God. And so not only does he personify peace and produce peace, down in verse 17 of Ephesians 2, Paul says, as he reconciled both to God, one man through the cross, putting to death the enmity, he came and preached peace. So Jesus not only personified peace, he not only produced peace, he also proclaims peace. Who's the only person that can give us peace? Only a holy God. And only a holy God can take on the righteous requirement of a holy God. So therefore he came as a God-man, went to a cross, abolished that enmity that was between holy God and sinful man, and now you and I get an opportunity to call him shepherd as he is my Shepherd, not only does he promise peace or proclaim peace, but he also promises peace. John 14, here's what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit of God. And you need to catch a hold of this because all of the rest of the passage of the 23rd Psalm deals with the person and the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Here's what he says in John 14, 
verse 26 and 27. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. Now how does Jesus leave the disciples peace? He sent the Spirit of God. So the Spirit of God is the promise of peace. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Why? Because Jesus says, my work, my person, my promise to you is to give you my peace. Not the world's peace. I want to ask you a question. If you had all the money in the world, would you have peace? The answer is no. You think you'd have peace. But if you had all the money in the world, you had everything that you wanted, you think you can have peace. You'll never have peace apart from the shepherd being your Lord. Not only is there the shepherd the personified peace, produce peace, proclaim peace, promise peace, but listen, Galatians 5, and 23, Paul tells us is the fruit of the Spirit, and so therefore it provides peace, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Why? Because the person of the shepherd moves on the inside of you. He takes a goat, makes him a sheep. Did you hear me? He changes the leper's spots. Who is the only one that can do that? Only a holy God. So not only do you find the satisfying of the shepherd, as David writes, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Don't get to the green pastures and skip over the he. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why, why am I not going to want? Because of him. It's him. Everything that I need is in him. Now watch this. Not only is the satisfying of the shepherd, there's the securing of the shepherd. What is the security that we have in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus? It says, he makes me lie down. He gives me rest. See, we have bought into the lie that the world has told us that you can have peace without rest. You can't have it. And you can't rest without peace. Some of us are working ourselves in the ground trying to find peace. Some of us are working ourselves in the ground trying to find rest. Here's what, he, here, here's, here's what he says. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So what does he do? He satisfies me with his person. And because I'm satisfied with the person, I now can rest in his promise. The sheep in the Middle East, every morning would get up. They graze and they browse about four in the morning. The shepherd begins to lead them out of the sheepfold. The dew is still on the grass. It's very quiet. The sheep will graze, browse, and just simply nibble, eat all that they would desire to have. About 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, the sun begins to be hot, and if at all possible, the shepherd finds a secluded place, hopefully a place that's shady and less overbearing in the summer sun. When green grass and, and, uh, and he... With green grass and allows the sheep to lie down. The sheep will lie down, listen now, for three or four hours just to chew the cud. That's what this whole point is. When we were in Romania, every morning we watched the shepherd lead sheep out behind the church. As a matter of fact, I took about 50, 50 pictures of him. And it was pretty amazing to watch what he did. Because what the shepherd has to be in mind is he has to take care of the sheep, but he also has to take care of the land. Let me tell you why. Because if he leaves them there too long, they'll eat it down to the roots. And tomorrow, there ain't going to be nothing but dirt. So he constantly moves them. Listen to me. Some of you guys hate change and you don't want to be moved. You're going to have to learn to rest in the person of Jesus Christ that he's moving you to another place so that you can always look back and go back and eat where you just ate. Did you hear what I just said? Some of us in this room settle for better and miss God's best. You say two paydays are better than one. Because we talk about the securing of the shepherd. What does the sheep do? He lays down. He begins to chew the cud. What, what does it mean to chew the cud? Well, it begins to simply 
to digest and ingest that which he's already eaten. And so therefore, the, the only way you and I can have the mind that is going to be stayed on Christ is we've got to know the Word of God. You're going to have to memorize the Word of God. You're going to have to learn to meditate on the Word of God. You're going to have to think on things that are noble and pure and things that are of, of the Lord. Why did Jesus look at, at Peter and say, you're not mindful of the things of the kingdom, but you're mindful of the things of the world. Get behind me, Satan. Because he told Jesus, that's not going to happen. Jesus says, I'm going to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me. And Peter goes, no, that ain't going to happen. How many times in our lives do we try to overrule and over, override that which God's doing in our lives? And we forget the word of God. Amen. Here's a side note. Peter didn't walk on the water. Look up here. Peter didn't get out of the boat and walk on the water. Peter walked on the word. Peter couldn't get out of the boat until Jesus told him to come. So when Peter stepped out of the boat, the reason the other disciples didn't get out is because Jesus didn't invite them with the word come. And so therefore, Peter stood on the word come and walked on the word of God. And when he took his eyes off of Jesus, he forgot the word. And that's when he sunk. You better find the word. You better learn to meditate in the word. Joshua 1.8 for our Sunday school class. We got to meditate in this law day and night. Why? Why do we got to hide his word in our heart that we may not sin against God? Well, two important facts. Y'all ready? Say amen. First of all, his authority. His authority makes me rest. His authority makes me lie down. See, rest does not come easy for a sheep. The only way a sheep will rest is if they can see their shepherd. Did you hear me? Because the only defense mechanism, I want y'all to hear this because I'm fixing to make an application for everybody in this room. The only defense mechanism that a sheep has is to run. Did you get it? The only defense mechanism that a sheep has is to run. But as long as a sheep can look at the shepherd and see the rod and the staff that comforts them, are you catching it? See, if you lag behind and the shepherd's leading and he gets over the hill, sheep get skittish. If sheep don't have somewhere to graze, they bite each other. Does that sound like a church? See, David knew this to be true. Are y'all listening to me? David knew this to be true in his own life when he was running from Saul. The same guy that wrote 23rd Psalm wrote the 42nd Psalm that says, my soul pants after the living water. As he's hunkered down in a cave, asking God to do something. That's the same man that wrote this. David says, Psalm 4, verse 8. Listen to what Psalm 4 verse 8 says. I will both lie down in peace and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I want everybody to look up here. Jesus is not going to get rid of all the trouble in this world for you. But in the midst of the trouble, he's going to be the peace of the good shepherd. What do you think about this for a second? You remember when Jesus told the disciples to get in the boat and was going to the other side, and when they get out in the middle of the, of the lake, the storm brews up, Jesus is down in the bow of the ship. Y'all remember? He's asleep. And the disciples are going, what are we doing? The Lord don't care. And they go down, and they wake him up, and say, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? Do you not think that the Lord knew that the storm was coming? I want you to hear me. If the Lord would have thwarted the storm, then those disciples never would experience the peace of God in the storm. Storms are going to come in your life. Trials, tribulations, and tragedy is going to come in your life. But you better learn how to lay down and rest. Because he is the person of peace. He makes me lie down. He causes storms in my life to make me dependent upon him. 
You better be very careful to ask the Lord to cause you to be patient. You better be very careful to ask the Lord to, to do whatever it takes so that you can get to know him and get closer to him. I'm telling you right now, he may take everything you've got. Are you listening? He may put you flat on your back. He may take every finance that you have so that you become dependent upon him more than you are dead presidents. And listen, if he does, he's still a good God. Most of us in this room, we only say he's good when things are going well. But what if the what if the land's barren? Well, he's a good shepherd. He's going to find some green pastures. And he's going to let me eat. And he's going to make me lie down. As I see him, I rest. When I understand the person and the work of Jesus, I now can rest. I can remember growing up, my dad was a truck driver. He'd leave on Sunday afternoon about 4 o'clock. If he had a good week, he'd get in about Thursday night around 8 o'clock. If it was a bad week, he'd get in on Saturday, sleep for about 24 hours, and get up and do it again. But I can remember because I was scared of my shadow because of my two older brothers. They're going to give an account to God at the judgment seat of Christ for all the stuff that they did. But I want you to understand, I slept better when my daddy was at home. I want to ask you a question. Are you anxious about anything in this room this morning? It may just very well be that you need to catch another glimpse or a renewed glimpse and a refreshed glimpse of the goodness of the shepherd. Here's what David says. He gives me suitable pastures. He gives me pastures that are green. He doesn't just take me to any place. It's this word. When I open the word of God and I begin to understand that the promise that he's made me, it's green pastures I can feast. I told our group uh, in Romania, and I told the Sunday, uh, the, the Sunday school teachers, my problem is not studying the Bible. My problem is getting it open. Did you hear what I just said? Because once I get it open, I can study. But my problem is getting it open. Does anybody know what I'm talking about in this room? Once you get it open, it, it, you're all right. He makes me lie down in suitable. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Not just pastures, but he lets me lie down in green pastures. I know Psalm 103. I'm still. I'm being still, and I know that he's God. Psalm 46.10. Psalm 103, know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who has made us, not we ourselves. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Don't forget that verse. Brother Brad, you don't understand. I got sickness. I got this. I got that. I got more month than I do money. Listen, He is the good shepherd. Psalm 46.10, be still. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Guys, sometimes we forget what we know. Tim, I'm going to pick, everybody else looking at me like I'm crazy. Is that a fact? Do you forget what you know? And you go, well, do I really know it? Yeah, you know it, but you forget. Why? Because the circumstances of life invade us and causes me to forget the goodness of the Lord. And so what I do, I quit laying down. I start getting up. I start roaming around trying to figure it out myself. And I get to start eating. Listen, I start eating garbage, and I'll get in the briar thicket. Can I get an amen in the house? See, his authority gives me suitable pastures, but listen to me. There's a sufficient persuasion. He makes me lie down. He persuades me to lie down. He causes me to lie down. When I understand who he is, there's a persuasion in me to quit fighting and quit worrying, and I can rest in who he is. The Lord is my shepherd. What else is there? He makes me lie down. In green pastures. Why does he make me? Because it doesn't come natural. It doesn't come easy. I want to fight. I want to fly. I want to flight or fight, right? I want to run. And all along, the Lord's wanting me to understand that my security is in him. That my hope is in him. Why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. What is this? Sufficient persuasion involved in this rest. Well, Hebrews 12, verse 5 and 6. Listen to what this, the writer of Hebrews says. Now, we know 12, 1 and 2, right? Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every sin that encompasses us and run the race, right? 
who for the joy of Jesus, who for, let it fix our eyes on the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy of the Lord, right, of the cross. Go, go to verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation. There it is. You have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. Listen. Do not forget this. You're not a, listen, you're not going to be judged according as a slave or a servant. Yes, we're servants and we're slaves. But when I stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I won't be judged according to my service. I'm going to be judged according as a son. There's a major difference. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. We're constantly praying that God would allow us to have an easy life and go through this life with no troubles and trials in this life. James says, count it all joy when you fall into it. Why? Because it's a work of God in us that's working something in us so that he can work it out of us. See, God's got to do a work to you so he can do a work through you. Did you hear me? He's got to do a work to you so that he can do a work through you. He's got to knock you out of you so that he can, you can be filled with who he is. You can be controlled by the Spirit of God that lives on the inside of you. So there's a persuasion that happens in our lives. When things don't go your way, how do you respond? You get mad? Or do you step back and go, okay, Lord, what are you trying to do? When things are not in your timing, what do you do? Do you see the hand of God in it or do you get mad? See, his authority makes me lie down. It makes me rest. But listen, his affection makes me reflect. What does it mean to meditate? What am I doing as I reflect? As the sheep lays there, as they chew in the cud, here's what they're doing. They're constantly looking at the shepherd. When was the last time you just chilled out and gazed at the shepherd? I'm not talking about reading your Bible. I'm not talking about praying. I'm not talking about going to the mission field. I'm not talking about coming to church. When was the last time you just chilled out and focused on Jesus? I'm talking about just chilled out, rested, took his word, meditated on it, chewed the cud, constantly talking about who he is, how much you need him. His affection makes me reflect. What, is, what do I mean by that? Well, he's compassionate. According to Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, as Jesus overlooked Jerusalem, here's what Matthew 9, 36 says. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. So the compassion of the shepherd is, do you understand that God wants you to know more than what you already know? Do you understand that if you want to know God more than you, than you did when you walked in this room, God desires for you to know him more than you did when you walked in this room. If you're in this room and don't even know if you're saved, don't you know that God wants you to know that you're saved more than you want to know that you're saved? His compassion, his affection, he, is, he looks at the multitude and he says they're like sheep without a shepherd. But also his care, Isaiah 40 verse 11. His love and gentleness, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather lambs with his arms, y'all see that? He will carry them in his bosom. He gently leads and gently lead those who are with the young. Notice, 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 please notice. You cannot be led. Until you learn to rest in the shepherd. Why didn't he say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still water. Let me tell you why. Because until you rest in the shepherd, you won't be led by the shepherd. You'll roam and you'll eat wherever you want to eat. And constantly, every now and then, look to see if the shepherd's approving which is what happens in most American churches, is people do whatever they want to do and then ask God to bless what they're doing. Let your focus, let your eye be on the provision of the shepherd. There must be rest before you can follow. Number three, not only do we see the securing of the shepherd, the satisfying of the shepherd, but the supplying of the shepherd. Now what does he supply? You say, Brother Brad, he supplies peace. No, he is our peace. He doesn't give you peace. He is your peace. Did you hear me? He doesn't give you freedom. He is your freedom. Greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. Quit asking Jesus to give you something that you already got. Did you hear what I just said? That's how we pray. We say, Lord, give me peace. Well, if he is your peace, he lives on the inside of you. 
Quit asking him for something he's already given you. So how am I supposed to pray, Brother Brad? Say, Lord, thank you that you are my peace. Now let me rest in the peace. Because I'm not appropriating the peace that I've already gotten. If Wesley gave me $100, Brittany would slap him. But if Wesley gave me $100, and every morning I would look at Wesley and go, man, I sure do wish I had $100. Man, I sure do wish I, Wesley, would you give me $100? Wesley, how long is it going to take you to go, well, you idiot? Because I know you. That's the reason I picked on you, not Jaime. Huh? It won't be tomorrow. It'll be the first time I ask you. Right? Well, you idiot. I didn't give you $100. That's right. So tomorrow, when I ask you, amen? Is that not what we do to the Lord, though? Lord, would you give me peace? Lord, just give me peace. Well, Ephesians 2.14 says that he is your peace, and he's already lived on the inside of you. Why do you keep asking him to give you something that he's already, that he's already given you? Appropriate that who he is on the inside of you. Quit asking God to give you victory. He's already your victory. Just appropriate the victory that's on the inside of you. See, we have a wrong understanding and we're not satisfied with who he is. We think we constantly got to ask. Man, just appropriate who he is. The sheep is not asking the shepherd to do anything. They're just resting in who he is. They're not baying and moaning and groaning. Now, bad the sheep do it. Ain't nobody come to see me. We do, do we not? Why? Because we look for someone other than Jesus to be our satisfying security. And therefore, Jesus Christ provides us, listen to me, with him. Here's what he says. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Watch this. He leads me beside still waters. What is this, what is this an understanding of? Well, we can make the, the analogy and the illustration about, about a lot of things. But he begins with rest, but then he gives me refreshment. What is the refreshment? It's the Spirit of God. Why so downcast, oh my soul? Put your hope in God. There's a conviction that constantly, as I have the mullet grubs and I walk through this life, stepping on my lip, somewhere down the line, there has to come a time to praise. Who? Who can rescue me from failing? Only a holy God. Quit looking for anything and everything and look at the one thing and the one person that can do that. It's Jesus. Your baptism, your prayer, your church, your pastor, your Sunday school class cannot give you that. Your job, your career, your money, your retirement, your education cannot give you what you Desperately need, only Jesus Christ can be the satisfying shepherd in your life. What's the refreshment? It's his presence. He leads me. He leads me. He leads me. Y'all got me? That means that I'm in close proximity of him. He's leading me. I'm looking at him. I'm watching him. He's leading me. He doesn't send some other shepherd to lead me. He doesn't stand over there and say, hey, y'all, come on. He leads me. How does he lead me? By the Spirit of God, which is the water of God, which is the stillness of God, which is the peace of God. And so therefore that peace of God that lives on the inside of me by the Spirit of God, now I'm easily led. Did you get it? See, when you understand who God is and the peace of God that surpasses understanding guards our hearts and our minds and he puts his life on the inside of us, we now can be led if we'll rest in who he is. If we don't rest in who he is, then we're not going to be led. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8, and the Lord, he is the one who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear nor be dismayed. That's a promise of God. Then in John 14, Jesus quotes that and says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells in you. Listen, he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. So you and I on this side of Pentecost, what happened? At conversion, the Spirit of God comes and moves on the inside of us. This verse in John 14, verse six, uh, 16 and 17 was before Pentecost. He says he'll be with you and then he's going to come that he's going to move in you. 
When did he move in? On the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. That's a transformational verse. So you and I have a blessing that the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us that we're no longer orphans to go out here and stumble through the night trying to figure out what we needed to be doing. We just simply rest in who God is. So if he's going to lead, there's two things. Y'all ready? Say amen. He precedes the sheep. To be led, that means he goes before you. He doesn't drive you. You drive cattle or you lead sheep. You know the difference between driving and leading? Leading is you go before them. Driving is getting behind them and poking them in the rear end. Cattle have to be poked and prodded. Sheep are led. When are sheep led? When they see the shepherd. When they're full of the provisions of the shepherd. They can lay down. They can be refreshed. Now watch what he says. He leads me beside still waters. Now, why is that important? Because sheep are skittish. They're timid. And so a shepherd knows that they will not drink out of a fast-moving stream. So what a shepherd does is he takes rocks, he goes before them, finds a a fast-moving stream, dams it up so it pulls up so that the sheep can go and drink in a pooled stream so it's not rustling and running. You do understand that one of the worst things that can happen to a sheep is fall into a fast-moving stream. You know why? Because water is going to get in the wool. They don't have enough of body strength to overcome the, the, the different amount of strength of, of weight in that wool, and they're going to drown. So the shepherd knows what we need. Well, Lord, I don't know if I really want to step out and do that. I promise you, he'll lead you beside still waters. Will it be easy? No. Oftentimes, I've used this illustration, I'll use it again. Oftentimes in my own personal life, because nobody taught me how to pray, I would pray, Lord, give me peace. If this is your will, give me peace, give me peace, give me peace. And I never did it because God never gave me peace. Nobody ever told me that the peace of God comes when you step, not when you're standing. In other words, the peace of God comes when I step out. If God gives me peace here, I'll never step. Did you get it? Section over here, did y'all get that? Did, y'all, did I communicate that well enough? If I'm praying for God to give me peace right here, I'll never move. But when I begin to step, God gives me peace and I step. That's written his word as a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I take one step at a time, walking and appropriating that which he already has shown me to be true. Faith is not walking in in the darkness. Faith, listen to me, appropriating faith is when I move by faith into what God's turned the light on. I move by faith from where I am to where I'm going. So he precedes the sheep. He prepares the stream. He leads me beside still waters. So his presence leads me, but listen to me, his person leads me. What do I mean this person? The Holy Spirit of God begins to lead me. Psalm 116, verse 7, 8, and 9. Listen at this. Psalm 116, 7, 8, and 9. Return to your rest, O my soul. I love this verse. You know why? Everybody look up here. You know why? Because that means this individual isn't resting. There was a time that he rested, but now he's not. Return to your rest, O my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered for you. Talking about the Lord. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Shawshank Redemption. Y'all remember that movie? You've got to get some way of cleaning the language up. But the pivotal point of the whole movie is this. Not when he breaks out. But the pivotal point is when Morgan Freeman says this, you got to get busy living or you got to get busy dying. Did you hear me? And some of y'all in this room, you're getting busy dying. We ought to be living in the land of the living. The person of the Lord Jesus leads us. He makes us. He motivates us. He moves us. What does he do? He gives me rest over death. Psalm 116, 7 through 9. But listen, he gives me rest over despair. He, t- he says, my, my eyes have been cleared from the tears. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says this. 
the writer to the Jews who would have known this said Hebrews 2 14 and as much then as children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself not somebody else but he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil and release those listen release those who had been afraid to die release those who through fear of death were, were all their lifetime subject to bondage here's what I hear all the time in American Christianity well, what if I go on a mission trip and die man what a way to go I would rather be going on a mission trip and die than sitting here at the house being in disobedience and die. I've had some of you guys go, well, Brother Brad, you talk about some of y'all, y'all's episodes and experiences on the mission field. I tell you, man, you, you're doing nothing to, to encourage me and invite me to go to the mission field. Let me help some of y'all. I'm not encouraging and inviting you to go to the mission field. Matthew 28 told you to go. you got to have permission to stay, not to go. Did you hear what I just said? Man, if the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you, why don't you go tell the world? Because you're afraid of dying? Well, read Hebrews 2, 14 to 15. He's released us from that fear. Man, I'm so glad Paul wasn't afraid to die. I'm so glad William Tyndall wasn't afraid to die. I'm so glad Martin Luther wasn't afraid to die. I'm so glad all the people that were martyred for their faith were not afraid to die. Because you and I have an opportunity to hold a complete canon of Scripture in our hands. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying in the room? See, his person leads us. John 7, 37 through 39, Jesus on that great feast holds up out of that, uh, out of that water that the priest would wash their hands in, holds it up. Here's what he says in John 7. On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow. Y'all hear it? Flow, will flow, will run, flow rivers of of living water, verse 39. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit of God. You have a river running on the inside of you. He's going to feed you and lead you by a still small voice called the Spirit of God that's going to allow you to have a river flowing out of you. The Lord's my shepherd. What else is there? He makes me lie down. He gives me rest. He gives me refreshment. I don't know about you guys, but on Wednesday night, there's often times I just soon go to the house and stay at the house. I don't want to be here, but I'm so glad once I get here that the Spirit of God takes over, and I'm glad I'm here. Why? Because it goes beyond how I feel, what I think, and what I want to do. So let me give you three ways that he comforts us according to the book of John. How does he as person by the Holy Spirit comfort us? Y'all ready? Say amen. First of all, his voice. John 10 is the passage where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Listen to what he says in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. Now, I've already shared with you, you can't follow unless you're resting. See, you rest by knowing the voice. I don't know about you guys, but most of us in this room would say something like this. Brother Brad, I don't know if it's me or God. It's because we've not trained ourselves to hear the voice of God. We go and seek counsel from anybody and everybody. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, my dad could be sitting in the foyer right now and me not know it. The doors could be shut. He could clear his voice and I know he's in the room. My dad could say one word, and I could recognize his voice. You know why? Because my ears trained to hear his, hear, his, hear his voice. My daddy had an arm that could reach around the whole church and slap him in the back of the head. My daddy can just breathe. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? My dad can breathe, and I know he's frustrated. Is anybody listening to anything I'm saying in the house? You know why? Because I'm trained to hear it. Why is, why, why is it so difficult for me to hear the voice of God? It's because I haven't trained my ear to hear the voice of God. I've trained it to be religious. I've trained it to do what everybody else says. But I have not trained my ear to listen for the voice of God. And so my battle every day is to get up and say, okay, God. And so then what do we do? Well, Lord, give me a sign. Amen. Y'all heard the story about that, didn't you? The lady. In the flood, people called and said, hey, you need to get out of your house. The flood's coming. 
She says, if the Lord wants me to go, he'll give me a sign. Water started getting up into her house. <clears throat> and a dude in a boat come by and said, ma'am, uh, you need to get in the boat. We need to get out of here. It's flooding. She said, well, if the Lord wants me to get out of here, he'll give me a sign. Well, the water kept going up. She got on top of her house. And she said, Lord, if it's time for me to leave my house, would you give me a sign? About that time, a helicopter flew over. A guy on a, on a speaker said, ma'am, we're dropping down a line. If you get, grab the line, we'll take you to safety. She said, well, if the Lord wants me to leave my house, he'll give me a sign. Well, she drowned She stood before the Lord. She said, Lord, why didn't you give me a sign? He said, ma'am, I gave you a voice, I gave you a boat, and I gave you a helicopter. What else did you want me to tell you? Is anybody listening to what I'm saying in this room? There should be a bubbling walk from the inner man by the Spirit of God. His voice comforts me. Number two, his voice commands me. My sheep hear my voice, listen, and they follow. Well, I don't know who you think you are. You're going to tell me what to do. I'm going to say it a hundred times and a hundred times more. I said it in Romania. I've said it here a hundred times. I'm going to say it again today. What bothers me is some of y'all have never been bothered. I've been here 25 years, and some of y'all have never been convicted of one sin in your life. I've never seen you, some of y'all at the altar. I've never seen y'all weep. I've never seen you pray with your wife. I've never seen you pray with your kids. I've never seen any concern on whether or not you ever go to Sunday school or whether you come back on Sunday nights or Wednesday night. You have no concern of whether or not your kids are going to go to heaven. You have no concern of whether or not people in your family know Jesus Christ. What bothers me is some of y'all are never bothered. And those whom he loves, he chastens. And listen, those who are his will follow him. They don't have to be poked and prodded. Yes, we, he, we may be lazy and, and not get motivated to do, and maybe we show up 25 minutes late, but we're going to show up at least. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me by his spirit. He leads me by his goodness. He leads me because he's my shepherd. I'm not looking for anybody else to shepherd me. Thirdly, his voice not only commands me, his voice not only comforts me, his voice convicts me. They will follow me. Genesis 3.10 and Revelation 1.10 and 12. I want, you to, I, want to, I want you to see this. The Bible begins and ends with the voice of God. Chapter 1 of Genesis, he spoke it into existence. I want you to hear what happens in Genesis 3.10. Y'all remember after Adam sinned, what happened? Him and Eve see themselves, they're ashamed, they run, and they hide themselves, they're naked. Here's what Genesis 3.10 says. So I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. I don't know about you guys, but when you hear, when you hear the voice of the Lord, you're not going to jump up and high-five him. You're not going to go, thank you, it's been a good day. You're going to see yourself the way Adam sees himself. Revelation. John says it this way. John chapter, Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. Y'all see that? He hears a voice as a loud trumpet. Down in verse 12, here's what happens. Here's how he responded to the voice of God. Y'all ready? Then I turned to see the voice. Now, I don't know about you guys, <laughs> but there was a resounding voice in the life of John that when he heard it, he had to turn to see it. He didn't just go, oh, well, that was a voice. Let me give you an explanation. Let me, let me give you an illustration. When you pull up to a train track and you hear a sound of a horn, what do you do? You look to see. When you hear the voice of God, how do you respond? Just keep going the way you want to go? And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. So you got Adam. He hears the voice of the Lord and he hides. John hears the trumpet voice of the Lord and turns to see. So that's the response this morning. Is the Lord satisfying you? Do you find your satisfaction in who he is? Not what he gives you. 
but in who he is. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is the supply of the shepherd, the securing of the shepherd, and the satisfying of the shepherd is the provision of the one and only, the Spirit of God that he has provided for us to walk in this world, to be in this world and not of this world, and not to look to anything or anyone other than the shepherd who is the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd because the shepherd is my Lord. I shall not want. And because he's my Lord, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Come back next Sunday if the Lord doesn't take us out of here. He says it this way, as though it's an exhale, he goes, he restores my soul. He leads me beside still waters. Makes me lie down in green pastures. Y'all ready? Here's the R's. That's rest. He leads me beside still waters. That's refreshment. Beginning of verse 3, there's restoration. He restores my soul. Does he bind up my wounds? Yes, but he restores my soul. He does a work on the inside of me that goes, you know what? Regardless of what happens on the outside, as Paul says daily, I'm falling apart. My body, this thing is dying daily, but on the inside I'm being renewed day by day. Jesus has supplied everything that you need to be satisfied in the shepherd. Can you rest? Can you meditate on the goodness of God? When was the last time you really just thought that if it were not for the grace of God, you wouldn't be sitting in this room? Then sings my soul. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee, how great thou art. When was the last time you were overwhelmed by the shepherd? You can't be led till you rest. And you're not going to rest until you see the shepherd. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are. Not just what you do, but Lord, thank you that you are the good shepherd. You're the chief shepherd. You're the great shepherd. Lord, I pray that we'd find our satisfaction and our rest and our refreshment in who you are. So Lord, for the folks that's in this room, I, I pray you'd let us catch a glimpse of you today. For some of us, we've been roaming around for quite some time. We've been grazing at our own pace and our own pasture. Lord, we need to be returning to the rest. Lord, some of us are anxious. Some of us don't see you over our circumstances. So, so Lord, today I pray that across this body of believers, Lord, I just simply ask that you would allow us the opportunity to rest, be refreshed, catch a glimpse of who you are. Lord, who's the only one that can do it? Only a holy God. So we're dependent upon you to do it. Would you find us a people willing to obey, to rest and then be led? that you may be glorified as people see our shepherd and they don't look at the sheep and say, wow, what a sheep, but wow, what a shepherd. Would you glorify yourself today as we rest in the provision of who you are? Moms and dads, teenagers, grandmamas and granddaddies, are you resting? You got some folks in your in your family that's lost. Could you rest in the Lord? As they lead us, would you just take the next two minutes? Would you? Guys, that's 120 seconds. Would you just for 120 seconds 
just simply allow the Spirit of God to chip away whatever it is. That He may manifest His glory. You catch a glimpse as He makes you lie down in green pastures.